This podcast features criminologists discussing sensitive themes and topics. Listener discretion is advised. Twin sisters end up on a motorway in England where their actions would become the most shocking behavior ever captured on camera. This is the Sabina and Ursula Erickson story. Hi, Megan. I hope you're ready for today. Buckle Hi. up. This is a wild one. Yeah. You've set a high standard. I hope you can meet it because you said the most shocking actions to be captured on camera. And I went, what yeah. happened here? I've never heard of it and I'm ready. But, you know, you have a high goal. Yes. And I have to say the introduction, I, I do talk about the behavior, you know, captured on camera as being shocking. But there's many other things that happen in this case that may be equally as shocking as well. So how did you find this one? Uh, that's a good question. So this case was suggested by a few listeners. Um, I was trying to figure out a case to cover, so I go through our list. Yeah. And this course. one popped up a couple of times, so I was reading into it. It is an international case, which I also wanted to do something international, so we'll kind of check that box. And here we are, and I'm glad I did, because this one's going to leave you thinking for a while. With an intro like that, Amy, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Sabina and Ursula Eriksson were twins born on November 3rd, 1967 in Soon, Sweden. They had two older siblings, Bjorn and Mona, and by all accounts, they lived a normal life. Really, we don't know much about their parents or about their childhood at all, but I can tell you that they had no known history of juvenile delinquency, no known criminal convictions, and no known mental illness, which I think will be the most important part. As adults, Ursula relocated to the U.S., and Sabina lived in Mallow, County Cork, Ireland, with her husband and two children. Some reports say that this was her partner, not her official husband, and that these were her stepchildren. But so I'm not exactly sure. So they did spend their childhoods together. They did, but as adults, they uh, went their own ways. Separated. And okay. it's, it's not clear what their relationship was like, if they had a strained relationship or if they were close. They hadn't seen each other in a while. This is in May of 2008. Now, they would get together at this point when Ursula decided that she would travel to Ireland to see Sabina. And the twins were just over 40 years old at this time. Okay. But the sisters didn't stay at Sabina's place in Ireland for very long. As on March 16th, 2008, without telling anyone their plans, the sisters left Ireland and ended up in Liverpool, England. Now, I want to note that while it is widely reported that they arrived via ferry, no one has come forward ever to report seeing the sisters on the ferry. So it's not documented exactly how they got to Liverpool, but for the sake of following the reports, we're going to stick with the ferry. Okay. Now, importantly, why they decided to go to Liverpool is unknown, and they did not have any friends or family there. And this was a long trip. It's not like they were just popping over for an afternoon. It's not like us leaving Jersey to go hang out in New York City for an afternoon. And they didn't tell anyone, right? They didn't tell anyone, no. So weird. Okay. To get from Mallow to Liverpool, the sisters had to embark on a two-hour train ride from Mallow to Dublin. And this is where they would board the ferry. That is about another three to four hours from Dublin to Liverpool. This is quite a trip. It's quite a trip, yes. And it was an overnight trip at that. So they did not arrive until 8.30 a.m. on May 17th. And when they arrived by ferry, they went straight to St. Anne's Police Station, where Sabina reported concerns about the safety of her children back in Ireland. Now, the police were confused as to why she would report this, you know, to a British police station when she lived right. in Ireland, but they did their due diligence and they contacted Dublin police and asked them to do a welfare check on Sabina's children. Through this check, they discovered that Sabina had had a fight with her partner or husband, depending on what the relationship is. So the two had a fight the night before she left, but the children were seemingly fine and there was no reason for any causes for concern. I'm not even sure if Sabina waited around for this answer, though, because not long after making this complaint, the sisters boarded a National Express coach on its way to London, and this would be at 11.30 a.m. on the same day. Again, no idea why they were going there and what their plans were. So interesting already. <laughs> You're not even oh, like five minutes in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they're only about an hour and a half into the drive. Now, this is a packed bus. 
that the twins are on, the bus made an unplanned stop at the Kiel service station. Now, this is pretty much what we would call a highway rest stop in the U.S., and this was between junctions 15 and 16 of the M6 motorway near Kiel, England. Mm -hmm. There are mixed reports regarding the reason for the stop. One police report stated that the coach stopped because someone on board wasn't feeling well. Some reports say it was the sisters who said that they weren't feeling well. But the driver claimed that they stopped because Sabina and Ursula were acting erratically. Now, I wasn't there. I have no idea what erratic means. But I can tell you that both of the sisters held onto their large bags, clutching them tightly to their chests. And when the driver asked them to put the bags in the proper luggage space, they simply refused to. The driver then asked if he can search their bags. Because I, I just to put this in context, Megan, the London subway bombings were just a few years prior. Oh. And their behavior was very suspicious. So the driver was on high alert at this point. Based on the fact that they wouldn't let the driver look at their bags and their behavior at this point was making other passengers uncomfortable, the driver ordered the sisters off of the bus. And again, this makes total sense to me that the driver would make this decision for the safety of the other passengers on the bus. Yeah. So the sisters got off and headed into the service station where it was also reported that they were acting strangely. And the staff feared that the women maybe had bombs or other dangerous devices in those bags that they were refusing to put down. So the police were called to the scene and they arrived pretty quickly and they spoke to Sabina and Ursula. But they concluded that these women posed no threat of harm either to themselves or to others. I'm not even sure if they searched the bags or not, but okay. Maybe it was just based on their affect. They made this conclusion, but it seems like, you know, maybe um, maybe they didn't do their due diligence because the sisters would leave and the police left as well. And this would be a decision that many people would come to regret later on. Whoa. The twins left the Kiel service station, but instead of waiting for another bus or even calling a cab, they walked along the British highway, which, unlike the U.S., doesn't have a shoulder where cars can pull off if necessary or perhaps would be a safer area to walk in. I'm sorry, are they walking on the highway then, pretty much? <laughs> so Britain has what's known as a central reservation, and this refers to the narrow piece of land that's between two halves of a large road. Now, I have to tell you, one of my favorite things about covering international cases is there so many things to learn? Yeah. Like in this case, there were so many terms that I find so, they're just cute. And I don't know, I really like just cute. Um, the way they call things. Like trucks are called lorries. Who knew? You know, there's lots of stuff that I learned. Well, anyway. I actually knew that, but that's okay. Anyway. <laughs> okay, I understand. You do learn a lot of really, yes. you know, kind of like inside baseball things. Exactly. That you so, Megan, this is simply what we would refer to as a median. It's a grassy part that separates the northbound lane from the southbound lane. Got it. But this isn't just like a local road. This is a highway. This is several lanes on each side. Okay. And just to get a picture of this, because I saw a video, these metal barriers that like protects the grassy area from the road, we're talking about it being maybe like shin or knee high. Okay. So not much protection there. Not long after the sisters began walking the central reservation, they jumped the barrier and darted across the road into oncoming traffic. Oh, my goodness. And Sabina got grazed by a vehicle. And this vehicle was said to have been going over 50 miles per hour. But somehow she did not seem to be injured. And Ursula was not hurt at this point either. But, of course, they were putting everyone on the road in danger. And you could see this in the video. You know, it's just like cars are swerving. They're stopping. Nobody knows what's going on. Okay. Quickly following this bizarre decision by the twins... Highway agency officers headed to the scene. This is yet another new term, Megan. Now, these officers monitor traffic, so they're watching traffic in real time on CCTV. Mm -hmm. And they do this to ensure that roads and infrastructure is running smoothly. Now, they have the powers to stop traffic so that incidents can be safely dealt with. And sometimes they also pass evidence onto the police if they witness something dangerous, but they're by no means an enforcement organization. Okay. So as the highway agency assessed the scene, the Central Motorway Police Group was also called. And Megan, these officers weren't alone. They had a whole film crew with them since, by sheer coincidence, that day the film crew of the BBC reality TV show Motorway Cops was tagging along and recording. Ugh. So every single thing that happens next is all recorded on film and can be seen online. 
What a coincidence. Okay. So there's so many things about this case that make it interesting, but Mm -hmm. I think this might be the clincher here. Okay. Often we post videos on our YouTube channel that go along with episodes, but I will not be posting this video because it is uh, very hard to watch. It's traumatic and we're not in the business of perpetuating things like that, but it's out there if you want to see it. Mm -hmm. I'd say uh, viewer discretion advised if you do choose to watch it. Okay. So what happens next? Motorway police stopped the twins from re-entering the roadway as they talked to the women. The women actually seemed pretty calm, especially considering one of them had just been grazed by a speeding car. In the video, you could see them chatting with officers. You know, they smoke cigarettes, just acting kind of breezy, like just normal conversation. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, Ursula darted for the road again. And the officer she'd been talking to grabbed her coat to try to stop her, but she was able to wiggle herself free And she read right into the side of a truck that was traveling (gasps) over 55 miles per hour. Oh, my. Like she just ran straight into the truck. Now, and the impact was so hard that you can see her shoes thrown across the roadway in the wake of the collision. And you could hear the audible gasps of all the officers who just witnessed this shocking event. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's not all, Megan. Only seconds later, and much again to the shock of the officers and the film crew— Sabina also dove into the road again, smashing into the hood of an oncoming car. Oh, my gosh. So there's I'd say there's just mayhem at this point because everyone's just like, what did we what just happened? What did we just see? I assume both of them were killed on impact. They absolutely were not, Megan. What? Both women were in critical condition. Now, Ursula, the sister who ran into the truck, her legs had been crushed by the truck. We're talking like a big, and as they say there, lorry, not a truck, but it was a very big truck. You could see the car that Sabina ran into. The windshield is smashed in. Yeah. And Sabina was unconscious for about 15 minutes, but she then came to. Oh, my gosh. Now, by this point, the road was shut down as a medical helicopter came to airlift the women to the hospital. But as the medics were on their way, Sabina who is the one who jumped on the hood of the car. Yes. She woke up and immediately clawed and spit at the officers who were trying to help her. She screamed, quote, I recognize you. You're not real. And bizarrely, she also made a claim about someone trying to steal her organs. Okay. Now, despite the officer's effort to calm her, Sabina shockingly rose to her feet and started screaming for the help of police, who, of course, were already trying to help her. But clearly, she didn't recognize this fact. Mm -hmm. Right. Sabina began to ask, why do you kill me? Then she punched a female police officer in the face before jumping the barrier and running into the roadway a third time. Oh, my goodness. And what happened this third time? Well, luckily, traffic had been stopped. Right. For the helicopter. So the police, she didn't realize this, but the police had already shut down the area. So they were able to apprehend her. Now, she was clearly very agitated in the video. You know, she took off her coat and she was kind of flailing around. She was handcuffed by the police. Now, it took about five grown men to carry her away to emergency vehicles. And all the while, she's screaming. Actually, they had no choice. They had to subdue her at this Mm -hmm. point because they needed to give her medical assistance, which she was simply not able to receive. Oh, sure. They had to. So both women were taken to the hospital where Ursula was diagnosed with double leg fractures. It's amazing to me that she not only survived, but not that that's not a severe injury, but I would have thought she would have lost her legs. They were severely crushed. I am surprised that they lived. Yes. And yeah, leg fractures. I mean, (laughs) I thought you were going to tell me that her legs were no longer going to be in use. And not only that, Sabina had no injuries at all. So much so that she was released from the hospital immediately and taken to the police station to be processed for assaulting an officer and trespassing on the motorway. Now, this part was still on video of her in the police car. She's wearing her hospital gown. They take her from the hospital in her hospital gown to the police station. And she's pretty calm in the car, kind of just chatting up the officers, almost seems flirty with them. It's like fixing her hair at times, making jokes. I, I don't I don't know the way it's done for sure, but I mean, to me, I don't know, this woman is screaming for a psychiatric evaluation before being processed, but okay. Maybe that's, you know, maybe it's a referral after, I don't know the way it works, but it just seems that there would have to be an evaluation. That's going to be a huge point of discussion in just a bit. Okay. So, you know, Sabina, like I said, acting calm, 
funny, you know, very just joking around, didn't ask a question about her sister. She readily pled guilty to her charges and she was sentenced to one day in custody. One day? (laughs) One day. Now, despite some of the officers suggesting in the filmed footage from the motorway that the sister should get a psych eval, Sabina did not receive any psychiatric evaluation during her 24-hour imprisonment. Mm. And after spending just one night in the police station, she was released. Now, she was released into an unknown area with the clothes on her back and a small plastic bag of her belongings. This seems a huge mistake to me, but okay. So she was released into the town of Stoke-on-Trent. A few hours later, two men, Glenn Hollinshead, a 54-year-old former Royal Air Force medic, and his friend Peter Malloy were walking Glenn's dog around 7 p.m., and this is when they came across Sabina, who was wandering the streets. Now, Sabina seemed friendly, you know, stopped to pet the dog, was talkative. She did seem a little nervous, but overall, the men were willing to chat with her um, because Sabina asked the men if they knew of any place she could stay, saying that she wasn't from the area. She said she was looking for her sister. Unfortunately, the men said there were actually no places nearby. However, Glenn, being the nice man he was, offered to help her. You know, Glenn took pity on Sabina. And this is everyone that knows Glenn said this is just his nature. Okay. So he suggested that they go back to his house so that he could try to help her figure things out, how to find her sister and a place to stay. I would never suggest any woman go home with strange men offering to help them. No. But Sabina followed Glenn and Peter home. And luckily for her, these men were really nice and they were actually just trying to help her. Mm -hmm. In fact, Glenn even called around to see if he could get some information on Ursula. He was really trying to help her. So the three of them hung out at Glenn's house for a little while, and it was reported that Sabina was acting kind of odd. She was acting what you would say is paranoid. She kept getting up to look out the window as if someone was following her. Now, this led the men to think that maybe she was perhaps in an abusive relationship and she was trying to escape something. At one point, she offered the two men a cigarette, but then as they went to smoke the cigarettes, she snatched them out of their mouths, claiming they might be poisoned. So she's exhibiting some strange behaviors. Mm -hmm. Glenn was not worried about Sabina's behavior. He thought it was a little strange, but he didn't want to kick her out onto the street at night. So after Peter left to go home, Peter left around midnight, Glenn set Sabina up in his apartment for the night. Now, Peter says he felt really uneasy about this, but he trusted his friend and, you know, his, his friend made him feel at ease. You know, everything's fine. The following day, Glenn spent most of the day trying to help Sabina locate Ursula. He even called his brother who worked in the healthcare system to try to help him locate her. Unfortunately, they had no luck with finding Sabina's sister, but the two were having a nice enough time together that he was making them some dinner. During this point of making the food, Glenn went to ask his next door neighbor if he could spare some tea bags before going back into the house where Sabina was waiting. However, under a minute later, the neighbor saw Glenn stagger back outside covered in blood with multiple stab wounds. He had a feeling this was coming, but... Okay. Did he survive? Well, Glenn was able to say to the neighbor, she stabbed me. Look after my dog for me before falling to the ground. Oh. Unfortunately, he did not survive the attack. Oh. Meanwhile, Sabina slipped out of the home and ran down the street. Isn't it interesting, Megan, that, you know, we look at, you know, men are the threat and, you know, she shouldn't go back home with him. And then it turns out that she was actually the threat. Well, the reason why I'm sure he let her stay, too, yes. is because women are perceived as less threatening. I mean, it, in fact, we are inherently less violent or we perpetrate yes. much less violent yep. crimes. But, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes the threat is, you know, hidden in that regard. Mm hmm. And I didn't mention, but, you know, the women were pretty small in stature. They didn't look very threatening, probably. Anyway, so the neighbor, obviously shocked, immediately dialed 999. But sadly, Glenn was deceased by the time they arrived. Sabina had stabbed him in the head four times with his own kitchen knife. In the head? Jeez. It's brutal. Okay. Now, as paramedics were on the scene, Sabina was all the way down the road. And again, CCT footage would catch some of this. You can see her in the footage kind of running around erratically and holding a hammer. A passing motorist spotted her hitting herself in the head nonstop with the hammer. And again, this is a hammer that she had taken from Glenn's apartment. So this good Samaritan got out of the car and tried to restrain her. But when doing so, she hit him over the head with a roof tile that she had in her pocket. She then ran to a nearby bridge called Heron's Cross, where she jumped 40 feet onto the roadway below. And this wasn't an empty roadway. This was, in fact, a busy highway. This time, I have to imagine she died. 
Megan, somehow she survived yet again. 40 feet? Yep. She did break both of her ankles and she fractured her skull, but she did survive this fall. It's unbelievable. This, I'm Not even to make light of it, but like this woman has nine lives. I mean, seriously. Yeah. That'll lead to some conspiracy theories, I think, as oh, well. <laughs> it's unbelievable that she could sur- survive all of this. Yeah. She was taken to the hospital and she spent over three months recovering in the hospital. So on June 6th, she was arrested, but she stayed in the hospital until September 11th. And this is, again, in 2008. Upon her release, she was sent directly into police custody on murder charges. Hey, Amy, this is a long time. What what happened to her sister Ursula during this time? I'd say ironically, Ursula was also released from the hospital that same exact month. So she spent the same amount of time in the hospital, but she was never charged with any crimes In fact, she went back to Sweden, probably to visit family before returning to the U.S. to reside. Are we going to, is there going to be a psychiatric evaluation of either of these women or I just want to know. Not telling you. Uh, And (laughs) I want to point out it's also unclear and actually more, I'd say, leaning towards unlikely that Ursula and Sabina had any contact at all before her sister left England. Now, the trial was set for February of 2009, but there were several delays due to the fact that Sweden has strict medical privacy laws. So there were trouble getting medical documentation, I guess, that the lawyers needed for Sabina's trial. So Sabina remained in prison. And on September 2nd, 2010, she pled guilty to manslaughter with diminished responsibility. There was simply no explanation for her behavior. Every question put to her was greeted with the reply of no comment. And very surprisingly, the video from the highway where she clearly purposely ran in front of a car, that was never shown in court. And I'm not sure why it seems like that would provide evidence for, you know, what they're going for, the diminished capacity. Well, there's possible reasons for exclusion. I'm sure her, I'm sure her, her team or her defense attorney motioned to have it excluded. Yeah. Did her, uh, do you know if there was a request at this point for a psychiatric evaluation? Um, Did one happen during the trial? Yes. Okay, yes. So the prosecution and the defense both claim that Sabina was insane at the time of the killing. Interesting. Okay. Though not at the time of the trial, meaning that she was competent today. So she was insane at that time because we're talking, you know, over two years later at this point. Right, right. Now, the defense claimed that Sabina was a secondary sufferer of a rare diagnosis of Foley Adu. I was thinking, I just want you to know, I was thinking that like way back um, when I heard that they both jumped into traffic, Mm Fale Adu popped right into my head. Yes. So, so Megan, let's break this down. And yes, you all know, I don't pronounce things correctly and I'm definitely not French. So it could be Fale Adu. It could be Fale Adu. So I will tell you, I'm admitting I'm not sure my pronunciation is correct here. So Fale Adu is French for a madness of two. Essentially meaning that they're claiming that her sister Ursula was delusional and had transferred these delusions onto Sabina, who had auditory and uh, visual hallucinations during this episode. Megan, I'm sure you recall, our listeners might not, though, because way, way back, one of our very first Mm -hmm. episodes, you know what I'm going to say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Juliet Hume and Pauline Parker. This was episode four. This was a long time ago, so I think you should all go listen to it, but we were very new into this, so I don't know what we sound like. It was over four (laughs) years ago, so don't judge us, but go take a listen because that case is a super interesting case. We talk about it in that, but that was so long ago. So let's really quick break down Filet Adu. I'd just like to point out, too, for our exclusive supporters, I also did cover Filet Adu in the Slender Man case. Oh, yes, you're right. So as mentioned, this is a rare disorder that's characterized by sharing a delusion among two or more people in a close relationship. Now, this is where the inducer, which is considered primary, has a psychotic disorder with delusions and influences another non-psychotic individual who is considered the induced or the secondary. Now, the exact cause of shared psychotic disorder is still unknown, but there are certain circumstances surrounding the phenomenon. One is that the disorder tends to be more common among females Mm -hmm. and also females who have closer relationships. So we see this, you know, sisters or friends We do see it among married or common law couples as well. Social isolation can also be a cause because most reported cases indicate poor interactions with society. And I don't think you'll be shocked to hear that personality disorders also have been a reported factor with individuals described as neurotic, introverted, and emotionally immature. 
Some case reports also notice features of personality disorders, especially dependent, passive, schizoid, and schizotypical. Mm-hmm. Other factors can be untreated mental disorders, cognitive impairment, or and or stressful life events. Now, recall that Sabina did have a fight with her partner the night before the incident. So maybe there was some, you know, stress in her relationship. So that could have been a catalyst, but we'll break that down um, more so during the discussion. Let's go back to the court for a minute. The judge accepted this diagnosis and he only sentenced Sabina to five years, acknowledging that the sentence will seem inadequate to the victim's family. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit about what the judge stated because I find this interesting and I'm wondering if you think this would happen here. Okay. Okay. The judge stated, while the mental illness resolved quickly, both psychiatrists implies that there was someone, there were psychiatrists on both sides who agreed on this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. While the mental illnesses resolved quickly, both agree it was serious and that she behaved in the way she did because of her illness. Her culpability for her behavior is, on the medical evidence, accordingly low. She was suffering from delusions, which she believed to be true, and they dictated her behavior. It is also not one of those cases where the defendant could have done something to avoid the onset. It had a sudden onset. It was a serious illness while it lasted, and it resolved rapidly. Sabina's attorney remarked that her and her twin sister, Ursula, were, quote, living in their own world when they ran across the motorway. Continuing, quote, they had an enormously strong bond as twins. At some stage, the defendant's own psyche was overborne by her sister's illness. Now, Megan, this implies that Ursula had a mental illness, uh, a mm-hmm. diagnosed mental illness, and that this and that Ursula was the one who was, you know, the most mentally unwell. But I didn't see any evidence to suggest this. But of course, this could just be that it wasn't public information. But that's it, it sounds like that's the narrative here, right? I think with Folia Adu, too, isn't there usually one of two or one of more mm-hmm. who is the person who develops the original yes. delusions or thoughts yeah. and then kind of impresses on another? But it's unclear to me what evidence led them to say that Ursula was the primary and that Sabina was secondary. Well, if you don't have the evidence, you just don't have it. Yeah. So, I okay. mean, doesn't mean it's not there, but yeah. I understand. Yeah. And while Sabina didn't speak out, her lawyer's on her behalf, said that she was appalled that she had killed somebody and that she had turned to Christianity in prison to help her deal with the matter. Meanwhile, Glenn, the victim, his family made a public statement placing blame on many other people than Sabina. Quote, her mental condition should have been properly assessed after what she did on the motorway Mm -hmm. and the experiences that the police had. Her mental disorder should have been picked up prior to her being let out into the community. We don't hold her responsible, the same as we wouldn't blame a rabid dog for biting someone. She is ill and to a large degree not responsible for her actions, but her mental disorder should have been recognized much earlier. Now, this is an incredible response from a grieving family. I was thinking the same thing. And I have to say, I agree that this was a systemic failure and showed severe police incompetence. Yeah, I mean, I I don't understand why they were not both immediately given psychiatric evaluations. That would have seemed that just seemed very obvious to me that they should have been. So I think that's appropriately probably placing the blame or the area of prevention that could have happened. Now, since so much time had passed during the court proceedings, Sabina ended up serving less than 500 days in prison for the murder. I mentioned earlier that some reports say because they were trying to get medical records from Sweden. So this makes me wonder if perhaps there there was past medical uh, mental health diagnoses or maybe Ursula's mental health. They're trying to get files about Ursula's mental health. I'm concerned that the sentence does the sentence involve aftercare, treatment, supervision, mental health. That's what I'm more concerned about here. Good question, because Sabina Erickson was released from prison in 2011 and nobody knows what became of her Mm. or her sister, Ursula. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know that Ursula has been said to live in Washington state and she is very involved in religious organizations. I'm not sure exactly which ones. My hope and assumption is that they change their names and are living law abiding lives just out of the public eye. I hope so as well. For everyone. Yeah, I was pretty shocked um, by that sentence. And not only from a victim restitution or a justice standpoint, because it sounds like the family was at peace with it. Mm -hmm. It's more so for public safety. Public safety. That's what I was thinking. Public safety. Now, as I mentioned, this is a wild case. And I think now you can see why. (laughs) Um, There are many theories to go over here, many things to unpack. Now, at first glance, it could be suspected that perhaps the twins were on drugs. They seemed invincible and seemingly felt no pain at all. 
And many who read about this case certainly thought that drugs were the most viable explanation. But there is really no evidence that the twins were on or ever used drugs of any kind. That would have come up in the hospital toxicology. Yeah, I would assume so. They said nothing in the records about it, but I would assume, yeah. especially for Ursula, being that she was in the hospital for so long after that. I think it also would have been a factor, a differing factor at tr- at Sabina's trial. Yes. So was this really a case of folia do? Now, cases such as this are very rare. In fact, there's less than 10 known cases globally. Some sources say historically there's only been 20 cases. Wow. And some professional psychologists and psychiatrists dispute the very existence of the disorder altogether. Mm -hmm. Because let's think about this for a minute. Did it just go away once they were separated? Because normally it would. Um, Part of the treatment for this disorder is to separate the two parties. Mm -hmm. But as we saw, Sabina went on to be very delusional, paranoid, and violent after she was already separated from Ursula. But that happened in a quick time period, too. It wasn't like after a separation of some time, because immediate separation might not be the cure, might take a little bit of time. Well, yeah. So in the literature, it says it depends on the person. For some, it is immediate is enough. Yeah. But then some say it could have been the perceived presence of her sister Mm -hmm. that kept the delusion going. Mm -hmm. But also, if Sabina was the secondary, not the primary, why did she have so much continued erratic behavior, whereas Ursula didn't have any erratic behavior that we know of? Right. Well, it's also possible that Ursula was not the primary. We just don't have the evidence either way. Yeah. So some people say maybe they had a suicide pact. That could be why they ran into the, you know, the motorway traffic to begin with. But I don't think I think that's too simplistic to explain the rest of this. Yeah. You know, we don't know the whys to so many of the questions surrounding this case. And many experts don't either. But let's let's throw around some possibilities here. Okay. number one, why did Ursula leave the United States to visit her sister? Now, perhaps they were merely just going to have a nice visit together, and maybe after the fight with Sabina's husband, things took a delusional turn. Or maybe Sabina called her twin because something was going poorly and she was looking for support. Mm -hmm. There's no way to know. Okay. You know, the the fight with her husband or partner may also be what caused the sisters to make the trip to England. This seems strange. Why would they all all the way there just to report the complaints about the safety of Sabina's children? Maybe it was that part of the delusion or a reality was that Sabina was very scared of her partner. Yes. And that's why they fled. That's possible too. Well, actually, and if you go with that idea that they fled, it's perhaps that in their eight hour trip from Ireland to Liverpool, maybe they started to have these shared delusions. And this is where it started. So maybe it didn't start until they were isolated, stressed out together. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't find any proof that they had issues with mental health in their youth. But again, documentation of their medical records were used in trial. And I think it's very likely that these records did show the court that the sisters suffered from mental instability on and off throughout Mm -hmm. their lives. Yeah. A lot of people will look at these videos and say, you know, how were these women so calm at the beginning of the footage only to run into traffic minutes later and start shouting about organs being taken? Seems like they were paranoid and likely suffering from delusions. Um, Not only did they talk about the organs, They were on high alert, looking around, seemed to be running away from something. So this led me to think, like, could this have been a brief psychotic disorder? Mm -hmm. What we know commonly as temporary insanity or temporary psychosis. This is a DSM diagnosis, brief psychotic disorder. And this is when it lasts between one day and less than one month. So I feel like that fits, that kind of fits with what was going on here. But, you know, again, with with what we know and what we don't know, it's hard to say. I don't know if it's that hard. I, I, I see shared psychotic disorder. I think they both were psychotic based on their actions. Yes, I, I, I couldn't say for sure, but I do think they're both psychotic in some way. Whether or not this is individual psychosis that they've kind of shared or whether or not they actually share the delusions mm-hmm. and it's folly ado, I think that's very closely related. The problem for me is not knowing whether or not this was instantaneous or if this is long seated behavior that we just don't have any information about their background. So we don't know if this was a pattern for them and maybe even they separated in life because they were problematic to each other, Mm -hmm. which wouldn't surprise me then when they rejoined Mm -hmm. that they would instantly be able to pick up on shared kind of delusions. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. I couldn't find any information about how much time they spent together. I know they did. I'm I'm almost positive they attended high school together. Mm hmm. But I don't know kind of at what point they branched off. You know, from looking at the video, 
I can see why so many people said they must be on like meth or ketamine or PCP, sure. something that would make them resistant to pain. What's it called? It's like I we know, know when people are on drugs, <laughs> super, oh, like superhuman. Um, sometimes certain drugs make you feel like superhuman. Yes, I know what you're talking okay. about. Yes. So the way that these women were acting in that motorway, it, it mm-hmm. seemed like they thought that either they wanted to take their own lives or they thought they were invincible. It's, it's very uh, shocking. Mm-hmm. So... There's really, again, no way to know about the mental health. So let's talk about something we can maybe get a better handle on here. Do we think the system got it right? Should Sabina have spent more time behind bars? Or, I think more importantly, should the system be responsible for not properly assessing the situation and letting Sabina leave after only one night in jail? I mean, we can't ignore the fact that their actions on the motorway could have killed and injured many more people. This could almost be like, I think this could be a a crime of attempt for what they were doing in that motorway. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I I mean, I think there was a failure in not having them evaluated. And I was terrified when you told me that Sabina spent one night in jail for this very, very serious Mm -hmm. behavior that I, I just think was dismissed for whatever reason. I don't know if it was dismissed because they're women Mm -hmm. or... It was dismissed for, you know, a a multitude Mm -hmm. of other reasons. But I think that's the failure part here. And also for me, the failure would be, and I don't know it, but releasing her if she only served 500 days. Uh, I'm not even saying she shouldn't. That's not an appropriate sentence. If she's deemed to be truly sick and mentally ill, then Mm -hmm. I don't have necessarily a problem with that. But I have a problem with no aftercare and and no, uh, you know, supervision. Yeah. And I was trying to get a better understanding on the UK system. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that they can only hold somebody for 24 hours. So at first I was thinking that's why they let her be released into the community. However, with a little more digging, I found that the Mental Health Act in the UK, which I believe was passed in the early 1980s, that says that you can only hold someone for six hours unless a psychiatrist deems them to be a risk to themselves or to the public. So I am wondering, perhaps they were not able to call in a psychiatrist in that time period that could provide the assessment. Did they not even call for one? Did they call for one and they couldn't get one? Like there's, I just have so many questions here. I mean, I don't know if any of those are true, but I can tell you with, I feel pretty certain if they had gotten a psychiatrist in that they would have been deemed a threat. Yes. A danger. Megan, do you think there was some chivalry going on here? I mean, these twins were thin, tall, blonde, young women who maybe were seen as less of a threat. Yeah. And- They were treated that way. Does this remind you of this reminds me of one of your recent exclusive episodes where you talked about Ruth Finley. Chivalry in the system. Uh Yeah, I think women receive the benefit of the doubt when they commit crimes in general, when they commit crimes that don't violate necessarily gender norms per se. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that these women, while they initially crossed that freeway and caused so much possible destruction and danger, Mm -hmm. they actually harm themselves and not other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, from what I understood, no one else was actually harmed but them. So I think they probably received chivalry, but it was totally misplaced at this point. I agree. I don't think it was recognized the amount of danger that they posed to so many people on that motorway. Or look, the amount of harm that they did also for people who probably had PTSD and a (laughs) lot of other effects after witnessing that. Yes. But the physical harm wasn't there. So it was probably like, well... They did something stupid, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, it's possible that they were on drugs or influencing each other, Mm -hmm. but they're, you know, they're women. And I do think there was a chivalry here. I saw an interview with one of the first responders and he spoke about just how traumatic it was because he was trying to save one of them from running into the street. And you could see in the video him holding onto her and like her getting out of her jacket and running off. And it's, I couldn't imagine like- being a few feet away from something like that happening and you just feel so helpless. And I'm sure, like you said, it's traumatizing for so many people. And, you know, yes. And then, of course, there's the victim in this case as well. And of course, you know, that was just so tragic because he was opening up his home to someone in need. And the real question of tragedy, too, is could this have been prevented much earlier? Because we don't know that. So it's not only that it could have been stopped probably after the highway incident, but Mm -hmm. it's entirely possible that this was preventable from a long time before. That is a good point, Megan. So clearly there were a lot of missteps in this case, but I think the fact that Glenn's family 
feels at peace with, you know, the justice surrounding this case. I think that is a positive outcome. And I would imagine this case probably changed the way the UK handles situations in which there's some questions about mental health stability. Yeah, I think so. And like you said, I really sincerely hope these women went on to live healthy and productive and law abiding lives. I agree. And I believe they have. Um, We haven't heard otherwise. So let's hope. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening today. Uh, Before we head out, though, Megan, we're just going to take one question from a patron. Okay, sounds good. And I like this question. What would you do if you did not work in the criminal justice field? (laughs) What other job? Do you want to go first or me? No, you go first. Okay. Um, I have a few things. It would definitely be something with animals for sure. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to be like a vet because I wouldn't be able to handle that. I think that takes a special type of person. But maybe I would like own a, I don't know, I would breed animals and just live on a farm. I don't know. (laughs) Um, I wouldn't mind being like, I also wouldn't mind being a like a travel guide and like travel all over the world. That would be fun. Yeah. You have romanticized notions, I think, about farming and and travel guide work, just so you know. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, no, no, Uh, no. I'm sorry. I would um, work with therapy dogs. Remember I told you I went to that I'm yes. seeing guide dog facility when I was in Portland yes. and seeing the way these humans work with these animals to teach them how to be of service is just incredible. That's what I would do. Okay. You? Those are better answers than mine, I think. Um, okay. I think journalism. I would have oh. probably pursued journalism. At likely, it would have come down to I wanted to be a crime journalist. Probably. I was just going to say, some, you think of something like totally off the radar. But that is still different. Journalism is different. I mean, working for a newspaper. Yeah, but I also covering would love cases to. in criminal justice. Yeah, but I would have covered other cases as okay. well. Or I would love to, as you know, I've forever been working on a fiction book. So a writer. In some regards, I would like to be a writer. I've always liked writing. So Megan, you're already a writer, though. <laughs> but it's but it's different. This is I know, right I research and fact. And I guess, I, you know, if you're looking at journalism, it would be that way as well. But I would love to write fiction, something creative, because I'm not okay. the most creative. So a creative endeavor, I think, would be for me. You're right. They're closely related. Sorry. <laughs> and you know what the difference is with yours and mine is yours can still happen. Mine, it's kind of like that ship has sailed. I feel like it would be too hard to switch careers. You, you're writing a novel already, aren't you? Yeah, I've been writing it for like five years. Sure. (laughs) And I'm on page like 25. Yes. All right. Well, you'll uh, maybe during maternity leave, you'll pick that back up. Oh, sure. I'll have plenty of free time. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for that question. And as always, thank you all so much for joining us today. And we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga. Script editing is by Abigail Bel Castro. Audio editing is by Siler Burr and Jose Alfonso. And music is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to follow and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as exclusive full-length episodes, lectures, a book club, and virtual happy hours with Megan and Amy. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women and prime. Sources for today's episode include Vice, Medium.com, Cheshire Live, BBC, GlobalGraybooks.com, the National Institute of Health, NHS.UK, and News.com.au.